Now, I'm going to read the headings of all of these chapters. It's, it's from chapter 27 through chapter 35. And let Why he's reading the headings to make his point, I have no idea, because the headings are not original to the text. The headings were added afterward. Clem Clement did not write the headings. <laughs> see if just from the chapters alone just the chapter headings alone if saint clement sounds like he's talking about and never says chapter alone where are you getting that the protestant understanding of faith alone so in chapter 27 the heading is this in the hope of the resurrection let us cleave to the omnipotent and omniscient god chapter 28 is this god sees all things therefore let us avoid transgression chapter 29 would any protestant evangelical or baptist disagree with that god sees all things therefore let's be good <laughs> Everyone agrees with that. And is, let us also draw near to God in purity of heart. Okay. Chapter 30 is, let us do those things that please God and flee from those he hates, that we may be blessed. Chapter 31 is... Again, he's trying to prove that this somehow teaches salvation by works and not by faith, just by pointing out that Clement is talking about we should do good works, we should avoid sin, <laughs> because it's pleasing to God is let us see by what means we may obtain the divine blessing chapter 32 which i've already read is we are justified not by our own works but by faith chapter 33's heading is let us not give up the practice of good works and love god himself is an example of us to us of good works chapter 34 is now he skips over chapter 33 never addresses it either he doesn't give a positive uh, presentation of 32 but he just glosses over 33 and this is crucial this is likely why he's only reading the headings, which are, once again, not original. Okay, the headings were not written by Clement. There's a, written, there's a place there afterwards. And he's reading the heading of chapter 33 instead of reading the actual contents of the chapter. So what does it say in chapter 33? It starts off this way. Now, keep in mind, he has just said in the prior chapter, And we too, being called by his will in Christ Jesus, are not justified by ourselves, nor by our own wisdom, or understanding, or godliness, or works which we have wrought in holiness of heart, but by faith, through which, from the beginning, Almighty God has justified all men, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And the very next chapter says, What shall we do then, brethren? Shall we become slothful in well-doing and cease from the practice of love? God forbid that any such course should be followed by us. Now, why is this important? Well, we've already established Clement's explicit language that even the works done by a regenerate man in love and holiness of heart do not contribute to one's justification before God. Man is truly justified by faith in Christ alone, without works. And much like Paul in the book of Romans, Clement anticipates an objection to this doctrine on justification. And what is that objection? Is the following. What shall we do, brethren? Shall we continue? Shall we become slothful in well-doing and cease from the practice of love? He's anticipating that somebody's going to say, uh, so what do you mean? I can just do whatever I want? Now, those of us who believe in sola fide, in justification by faith alone, who do any amount of evangelism, we get this exact objection all the time when we share the gospel. So what? Just live however I want? I can steal, I can lie, I can fornicate, and I'll still be saved? And of course, this is the exact objection that the Apostle Paul anticipates after he teaches the doctrine of justification by faith alone in Romans 3, 4, and 5. And in Romans 6, 1, it says, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He says, What then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Paul anticipates that exact same objection. Now, an important note to make is if you do not elicit this objection when you give the gospel, then you're not preaching the gospel. If no one ever accuses you of antinomianism, if no one ever accuses you of teaching that you can just live however you want, at least sometimes not accuse you of that, if they don't sometimes falsely under, uh, uh, understand you to be saying that, then you're not, maybe you should take a look at how you're preaching the gospel. Maybe it's not clear enough. But anyway... I want to examine now the Roman Catholic official dogma on justification and see if anyone would ever raise this objection to it. Okay, so the first thing we got to look at is the doctrine of preparation of justification or the disposition or what is actually the Roman Catholic teaching of initial justification. So I have here the canons and decrees of the Council of Trent. 
So here in chapter 5, it says the following. On the necessity in adults of preparation for justification and whence it proceeds. The synod furthermore declares that in adults, the beginning of the said justification is to be derived from the pervenient grace of God, that so they may be disposed through his quickening and assisting grace to convert themselves to their own justification by freely assenting to and cooperating with that said grace. So here we see it talks about pervenient grace, and really this is just rejection of Pelagianism, or the idea the man in and of himself can't seek after God. It is acknowledging that you need divine grace in order to even make you willing to go seek after God. Obviously that's true, and that's just to show that not everything that the Council of Trent says is false. But here, it also mentions a preparation that must occur in order to be justified. And it, it uses this phraseology here of convert themselves to their own justification, which is already strange. But it says you have to be prepared for justification. You need to have this disposition. And so chapter 6, the very next chapter, is going to describe in more detail uh, and it's going to uh, what this preparation actually entails. So chapter 6, the manner of preparation. It says, now they, adults, are disposed unto the said justice when excited and assisted by divine grace conceiving faith by hearing they are freely moved towards god and when understanding themselves to be sinners they by turning themselves from the fear of divine justice whereby they are profitably agitated and they begin to love him as the fountain of all justice and are therefore moved against sins by a certain hatred and detestation to wit by that penitence which must be performed before baptism lastly when they purpose to receive baptism to begin a new life and to keep the commandments of God. And then it says that this disposition or preparation is followed by justification himself. In other words, this disposition, this preparation must be there prior to justification itself. And so here, what you see is that faith is an aspect of this preparation, but it is not the only requisite for justification. In other words, faith is necessary, but not sufficient. And so it says that they, first, they must first begin to love God to love him as the fountain of all justice and it says over here by that penitence which must be performed so it talks about you have to love god you have to perform penitence so loving god as we have seen requires the keeping of his commandments if you love me you'll keep my commandments and as we have seen the greatest commandment in the law as a matter of fact is to love god it is literally the works of the law now diego andrada was the chief theologian during the proceedings of the Council of Trent. He was a Catholic, Roman Catholic theologian. So let's read his interpretation of the canons and decrees that he himself helped write being the chief theologian there. It says, he says over here, the ungodly is said to be justified by faith because faith is the beginning and foundation of justification for this reason that it in a measure opens the doors to hope and love, which are necessary works for preparing and obtaining justification the works of hope and love are necessary to obtain justification because through those works we perfectly apprehend christ so there's no mincing of words here andrada outright grants that the works of love are necessary in order to even obtain it obtain justification initially that we apprehend christ by those good works of love he's speaking by the way of the preparation the disposition that is necessary to even get the justification first, let alone, let alone preserving it. Now, keep in mind, this video is about Clement, what Clement is teaching, and whether his teaching reconciles with Roman Catholicism. Clement clearly says that even works done in holiness of heart, in love, do not justify you. So, keep in mind that when Roman Catholics appeal to the distinction of initial versus final justification, in order to make it seem like they can somehow agree with sola fide in some limited sense, they are appealing to a modern distinction that contradicts their official dogma. Because the actual justification, the, act the actual initial justification that Trent speaks of includes works of hope and love prior to obtaining the justification.
So now let's take a look at Canon 7 of the Council of Trent. Now the canons are just the short statements, the short anathemas or curses placed on the what they perceive to be the heretical position. And so Canon 7 says the following, If anyone saith that all works done before justification, in whatsoever way they be done, are truly sins, or merit the hatred of God, or that the more earnestly one strives to dispose himself for grace, the more grievously he sins, let him be anathema so here trent specifically places a curse on anyone who affirms the scriptural truth i mean the obvious biblical truth that all the good works done by an unbeliever by an unregenerate person is still sinful right the bible clearly teaches this whatsoever is not of faith is sin because all the good works that an unbeliever does it's not done out of the proper motivation of love of god and of neighbor it's done for selfish reasons to justify themselves right this is clearly biblical but the reason that they need to anathematize this concept is because of their false doctrine of the preparation or disposition for justification, which requires good works of penitence and love to be done prior to salvation, prior to being regenerate. So in order to obtain that justification, in order to be born again, you first have to do those works of preparation, of hope and of love and of penitence prior to being saved. And so that cannot be possible if you affirm, like the Bible does, that all the works done prior to regeneration, prior to salvation, are not good works. They're sin. Because all that is not of faith is sin. And then you got Canon 9 over here, which says the following, If anyone saith that by faith alone the impious is justified in such wise as to mean that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to the obtaining the grace of justification, and that it is in no way necessary that he be prepared and disposed by the movement of his own will, let him be anathema so here's an explicit rejection of justification by faith alone again this is speaking of initial justification it's talking about the preparation and the disposition that he be prepared and disposed by the movement of his own will we already saw that described above as doing the works of good uh, doing the good works of hope and of love and so initial justification in roman catholic theology is still done by works of hope and of love so that is the roman catholic doctrine on the preparation or the disposition for justification now here we get into the doctrine of the infusion of righteousness so in roman catholic theology once one has met the requirements of preparation or disposition then you are justified but the question arises what exactly is justification what quality is it of now scripture clearly and unambiguously teaches that only a perfect righteousness can justify that is only one who has perfectly kept the law of God to continue in all things written in the law to do them can actually stand before God and be justified. Now, since this is obviously impossible for any human being, for any regenerate, un, even, a re, even for a regenerate person, this is impossible. That being the case, we need an alien righteousness, a righteousness that is foreign to us, outside of ourselves, to be imputed unto us or counted toward us namely the perfect righteousness of Christ, who did perfectly keep the law. And so it is on the basis of the righteousness of Christ and his merits that believers are forgiven and we are justified and thus we're able to enjoy eternal life. And so this is also known as the doctrine of double imputation or the great exchange, right? My sins counted toward Christ. Christ pays for them. Christ dies for them. My sins are on Christ. Christ's righteousness is on me. And that is apprehended by faith alone in what he did for me without works. It's a legal declaration from God. You are declared righteous on account of the son's perfect obedience. It's a legal declaration. And we see this legal language in scripture all the time. For example, in Romans 8, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Now, Rome rejects this doctrine of imputation of legal imputation of christ's righteousness they call it a legal fiction because they'll say that god cannot call you righteous unless you are actually inherently righteous unless you yourself are righteous they reject the doctrine that christ's righteousness is imputed unto me and thereby i'm justified they teach what is known as infused righteousness so here we get to chapter 7 of the council which says the following what the justification of the impious is and what are the causes thereof this disposition or preparation is followed by justification itself which is not remission of sins merely but also the sanctification and renewal 
of the inward man through the voluntary reception of the grace and of the gifts whereby man of unjust becomes just and an enemy of, of and of an enemy a friend that so he may be an heir according to the hope of life everlasting the charity of god is poured forth by the holy spirit in the hearts of those that are justified and is inherent therein take note of that it's very important whence man through jesus christ in whom he is engrafted receives in the said justification together with the remission of sins all these gifts infused at once faith hope and charity for faith unless hope and charity be added thereto neither unites man perfectly with christ nor makes him a living member of his body so right away what you see here is that they are conflating sanctification with justification and so sanctification now becomes a part of your justification before god for everlasting life now we recognize that sanctification is a scriptural truth but it has nothing to do with your justification they are distinct things and what you also see here is that our righteousness before god for eternal life is according to the roman catholic inherent therein inherent righteousness righteousness that originates in us by which we are saved so that god does not count christ's righteousness as your own that's not how you're justified in roman catholic theology you're justified rather because god assists you in becoming actually righteous enough to deserve eternal salvation it's an infused righteousness that inheres in you it's not a foreign righteousness namely that of christ covering you it's your own righteousness think of how absurd that is now chapter 10 says the following on the increase of justification received having therefore been thus justified and made the friends and the and domestics of god advancing from virtue to virtue they are renewed as the apostle says day by day through the observance of the commandments of god and of the church faith cooperating with good works increase in that justice which they have received through the grace of christ and are still further justified so uh, once you obtain the infused righteousness, you must also continually increase your justification by keeping the commandments, including the commandments of the Roman Catholic Church. And good works further increase your inherent righteousness before God, which you already obtained by good works of preparation. Okay, So don't get lost. I mean, you, you don't get lost here. You have the good works for preparation. Now you have the actual justification. You are now actually righteous in of yourself and you grow in that righteousness and canon 10 says the following if anyone saith that men are just without the justice of christ whereby he merited for us to be justified or that it is by that justice itself that they are formally just let him be anathema so here rome affirms that the righteousness of christ is necessary in some sense right because it says if anyone says the men are just without the justice of Christ, you are anathema, right? So they recognize the justice of Christ, the righteousness of Christ is in some sense necessary, although it's not by imputation. It's not like God counts it as your own. But they also reject that it is Christ's righteousness itself that justifies us. So while they say it's necessary, it's not sufficient. It's not Christ's righteousness itself by which we are counted righteous. And the implications of this are blasphemous, if you just think a little bit. Because by affirming that Christ's righteousness is necessary in some sense, but not sufficient, and that yet you can improve that righteousness in yourself by good works, you're saying that you can actually become, in some sense, more righteous than Christ. Or that you can actually improve upon the righteousness of Christ, which is absurd and blasphemous <laughs> but anyway here in canon 11 it says the following if anyone saith that men are justified either by the sole imputation of the justice of christ or by the sole remission of sins to the exclusion of the grace and the charity which is poured forth in their hearts by the holy ghost and is inherent in them or even that the grace whereby we are justified is only the favor of god let him be anathema so here <laughs> is an outright curse on justification solely on the grounds of christ's righteousness imputed onto our account they are cursing that idea if you believe that you're going to hell <laughs> and instead they affirm that there must also be present a righteousness inherent in us so much so that we actually merit or deserve salvation to eternal life this is why they say that you are accursed if you say it is only the favor of god by which you are justified because it's not only in roman catholic theology it's not only the favor of god 
by which you're justified. It's by your own inherent righteousness by which you actually merit. You actually deserve it. So it's not only by the favor of God. It's not only that God is freely giving it to you. You are actually earning it. God is bound to give you the salvation in a sense. Canon 24 says the following. If anyone saith that the works, if anyone says that the justice received is not preserved and also increased before God through good works, but that said works are merely the fruits and signs of justification obtained, but not a cause of the increase thereof, let him be anathema. So once again, Rome affirms that justification is preserved and also increased by doing good works. And it goes out of its way to specify that if you believe the good works are merely the evidence of having been justified solely by faith, but not the actual cause of the justification itself, you are cursed. You're going to hell. <laughs> if you affirm that your own good works, unless, or rather, unless you affirm that your own good works merit salvation, deserve salvation, unless you affirm that, you're going to hell. I mean, this is beyond parody how unbiblical and ridiculous this is. But lest anyone think that I'm mischaracterizing the Council of Trent, and I doubt that anyone will be willing to say that, given how clear the text of Trent actually is, here is their chief theologian interpreting the text himself, which, of course, he presumably had a great role in writing. So here is, once again, Diego Andrada de Paiva. He says the following, because that man cannot be said to be just who is wholly defiled with the stains of sin, therefore God infuses love into the man, through the strength and power of which all faults are washed away, crimes are quenched, sins are expelled and perish, and every vestige of foul deeds is blotted out. And for this reason, justification has been placed more in the love which embraces the divine law than in the pardoning of sins, or rather, that justification must be placed in sanctification itself, and that it is a love which makes a man holy, pleasing, and acceptable to God. Now, understand, and then just to, to add on this, this last quote here, the outstanding works of the righteous possess the great power, not only toward the increase of righteousness by the benefit of Christ, but also for the meriting and obtaining eternal salvation. Understand what he's saying here. This is, this is truly mind-blowingly blasphemous because many are under the impression that while Rome rejects the positive imputation of Christ's righteousness, many are under the impression that they at least would affirm the non-imputation of sins uh, to the believer, that at least they would affirm that our sins are forgiven on account of Christ having directly paid for them. But no, Rome does not even grant that. Rome says the following, God infuses love into a man through the strength. That, where did he say that here? Let me find the quote. God infuses love into man through the strength and power of which all faults are washed away, crimes are quenched, sins are expelled and perished, and every vestige of foul deed is blotted out. In other words, your sins are not washed away on the count of Christ having paid for them. Your sins are washed away by your own inherent infused righteousness by which you merit your sins to be forgiven, by which you do so much good that you deserve to be forgiven of your sins. That's what the teaching of Tridentine Catholicism is. This is not Christianity. This is a veneer of Christianity. You merit your own salvation for yourself. Christ doesn't even pay for your sins <laughs> in Tridentine Roman Catholicism. You pay for them yourself by being so good with that inherent infused righteousness that you deserve to be forgiven of your sins. Of course, they're watering down the standard for righteousness that God has placed, which is to continue in all things in the law to do them. And if you keep the whole law and yet offend at one point, you're guilty of it all. It's not like you can keep 90% of it and therefore merit that you be forgiven for the 10% you don't keep. But that's what Rome teaches. It's not Christianity. It's a veneer of Christianity. You merit salvation for yourself. Christ only makes salvation possible by dying for you. But he cannot actually provide it in of himself to you. Now, Rome, of course, would qualify by saying, yeah, we earn it, but because God assists us by infusing love into our hearts, by uh, helping us become more and more righteous, by which we eventually do earn it. 
but God has to help us. So it's not all of ourselves. This is just selfishry, though, and it still results in boasting. It is literally the doctrine of the Pharisees. So here's the parable <laughs> of the Pharisee and the publican here in Luke chapter 18. It is literally the teaching of infused righteousness that the publican is holding, sorry, that the Pharisee is holding on to. So let's read it real quickly. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. So Christ is saying that the Pharisee in this parable is trusting in himself that he is righteous. But look how the, how the Pharisee words it. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Now, take note that the Pharisee is thanking God for the fact that he is good. So he is attributing to God the fact that he is righteous. It's not like he says he's done it all complete of himself. He's, in other words, thanking God for the infused righteousness that he's given him. <laughs> literally, literally Roman Catholic. Literally a Roman Catholic. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So, according to Christ, even if you say that, well, it's God to help me be this good, that I could merit my own justification. Even if you say that, even if you thank God for that, you're still trusting in yourself. You are still exalting yourself. You are still trusting in your own righteousness, according to Scripture. This is literally the teaching of Roman Catholicism here, exemplified by the Pharisee. Now, why did I just bother to go on this big tangent on what the Council of Trent, what official Roman Catholic dogma teaches about justification? Well, the reason why is that after Clement... And letter, yeah, we're, we're talking about the letter of Clement here. I know it seems so far off at this point, but we're talking about the letter of Clement. And after Clement goes out of his way to say that we are not justified by works, even by works which we have wrought in holiness of heart, even the works done by a regenerate believer do not justify us. He anticipates the objection to this teaching. Which is basically, wait, so you mean that I can sin all I want and live however I want and never do any good works and still be saved? That's the objection he anticipates in chapter 33 when he says, What shall we do then, brethren? Shall we become slothful and well-doing and cease from the practice of love? Now, here's my question. Would Rome's doctrine of justification ever elicit this response from anyone on planet Earth? Will anyone ever listen or read the Council of Trent and come away saying, so you're saying that I can live however I want and sin all I want and do whatever I want? No. No one. No one will ever listen to the doctrine of preparation and disposition to justification by doing works of love and of hope. And then God begins to infuse righteousness into me so that I actually become righteous enough in of myself to earn my salvation. And then I maintain this righteousness by doing more good works. Nobody's ever going to say in response to that, so you're saying I can live however I want and sin all I want. <laughs> no one would ever say that in response to the Roman Catholic doctrine of justification. But they do say it in response to Clement of Rome. They do say it in response to the doctrine of justification by faith alone. But they will never say that to the Roman Catholic doctrine of justification. And keep in mind, he is trying to make it seem, voice of reason is trying to make it seem as if Clement agrees with his doctrine. And yet his doctrine can never elicit that objection from anyone. 